the Thames, London of course, but also Greenwich, Woolwich, Gravesend, from where so many ships cast off to unknown lands. It's on the right bank that an unusual monument is attracting all our attention. Unusual because it is dedicated to a Frenchman, the only one of our fellow citizens to have benefited from this favor on the British soil. An obelisk of Aberdeen marble erected by popular subscription in 1854 in memory of the sacrifice of a French naval officer who had disappeared in the Arctic the previous year in the footsteps of Sir John Franklin's expedition, missing with all hands. All is said and done, an extraordinary epic and a forgotten drama. Like a vigilant guard, the memorial is located a short distance from the former Greenwich Marine Hospital, the grail of the English Navy, now a museum. Behind these columns, these walls, a chapel, and an ossuary for the dead of the Franklin expedition. A place steeped in history, usually closed, which had been exceptionally opened for us. It was therefore logical that Parks Canada, which was responsible for exploring the recently recovered wrecks of the Franklin expedition ships, the Erebus and the Terror, should preview a major exhibit there. A tribute to the 194 officers and crew members who died in search of the mythical Northwest Passage. This illustration will be published in the renowned British weekly newspaper, the Illustrated London News, on October the 4th in 1856. The impetus for the subscription in favor of a monument for Bellow was such that the sum raised far exceeded the expenses. The surplus was given to Bellot's three minor sisters who each received the equivalent of 20 years' wages of a worker of the time. A similar illustration will appear in the same newspaper four years later, relating an exceptional rise in the waters of the Thames as far as the foot of the obelisk. It reminds us of what the French poet Auguste Barbier wrote in 1841, addressing the waters of the river as already marked by destiny. Ô oh toi qui marche en silence le long de ce rivage noir et qui regarde l'onde immense avec les yeux du désespoir, où vas-tu Je vais sans folie me débarrasser de la vie comme on fait d'un mauvais manteau, d'un habit que l'onde traverse, d'un vêtement que le froid perce et qui ne tient plus sur la peau. Greenwich also gave its name to the meridian that passes through the observatory 
defining the Eastern and Western Hemispheres since 1783. Everything is calculated from this point. GPS, geodesy, nautical and civil aviation charts. And one can't help but imagining Bello visiting this highly symbolic place. He, who at each call or bivouac, whatever the weather conditions, was keen to make his scientific surveys. Finally, Greenwich is also a reference to universal time. In other words, this time, whatever it is, can be measured here. Vertiginous privilege of being able to watch time go by, time that is counted. Time is also counted for Bello. When, after obtaining a leave of absence without pay from the French Minister of the Navy, he went to Lady Franklin's home in London to take part in Sir John Franklin's search he couldn't just imagine what his tragic fate would be. It's from the Scottish harbour of Aberdeen that Bello embarks on May the 22nd in 1851 on board the Prince Albert, chartered by Lady Franklin, and under the command of Captain William Kennedy. A total of seven officers, all volunteers and unpaid, and 11 crewmen. The docks are crowded. The Frenchman is, as the local press testifies, a real star. Um. On several occasions, we have embarked from this same harbor for the Orkney or the Shetland Islands, and it has never been without a moved thought for this young Frenchman attracted by adventure. A requirement that we could easily understand. The Orkney Islands, the small harbour of Stromness, is located on the mainland. It is from here that Bello prepares to leave to the Arctic. the young man discovers the wild beauty of the islands he travels through after having borrowed a pony which he describes as stubborn. His elegantly written notes evoke the steep cliffs, the rough-sided shores covered with heather. He visits the main town, Kirkwall, and St. Magnus, the northernmost cathedral of the British Isles, elegant with its red and yellow sandstones. It's one of the most beautiful buildings in Scotland. But above all, at the bend in the path, through a coastal breakaway, he expresses the pride at the fact that Prince Albert, whom he sees in Somnes Harbour, has been flying the French flag next to the British flag since her departure from Aberdeen. It's not for nothing that Lady Franklin called him my French son. The Stennis, a striking and mystical circle of juridic stones, at least 300 feet long, he says, will impress him a lot. He goes there thrice for the landscape, the loneliness, the dark skies. He writes about his fascination and thinks he has gone back several centuries. Bello had insisted on being worn when the first iceberg would appear. How quickly I washed to the bridge, he wrote. On July the 29th, in 1851, Bello writes, There is a very special charm in the brightness of this light with almost no heat. How I regret my helplessness every day 
at every moment in this ocean of impressions. No matter how carefully you examine, detail the site, you will always find something new. The ship, like a ghost, glides without any other noise than that of the ice which cracks in the winding curves of a marble labyrinth. After sailing along the west coast of Greenland to a point the sailors call the Devil Thumb, Prince Albert, accompanied by the ships of the American expedition commanded by De Haven and the doctor Elisha Kane Kane, who will become Belot's friend, heads west, crosses the Baffin Sea, sails through Lancaster Sound, and then alone enters the Prince Regent Canal to finally takes up a wintering position in Batty Bay. A 2,035 kilometer, a 95 day walking tour through particularly hostile region begins. A sleigh ride as Bello will call it, passing west of Somerset Island after crossing a new strait that will bear his name, going up Prince of Wales Island to Cape Walker before returning to Batty Bay. Cold, snow, scurvy, hunger, exhaustion, a real forced walk that will be recognized as a feat, but so much effort for nothing. There are four little known illustrations in the 1853 first edition of William Kennedy's book. The first one depicts a group of men, in fact the small Kennedy Bellow team, sheltered in Somerset House built by John and James Ross during their four wintering periods from 1829 to 1833. Of course, there is nothing to distinguish below. The second show a few men assembling the ice bricks to make the igloo that will protect them from the storm. As an officer, Bello did not have to take part in the work. He is standing on the right side of the picture. In his notes, that will be edited, Bello expresses kind feelings uncommon in the circumstances for a dog of the expedition. Bello writes, Our dog is particularly attached to me, and when I pet her, the other dogs growl and seem jealous. There is a detail concerning the character who is a little of the scene. His hand put on a dog. Bello's hand? The third one is more troubling because of all the expedition. He was the only one who took the time to make scientific surveys. There is nothing in the legend that says that the character handing a telescope is Bello. But who else? Before returning to England, Prince Albert calls at Beachy Island. This is the fourth illustration. Beachy had been in turmoil since the graves of the first three dead of the Franklin expedition were found there. But there are no clues as to Franklin's intentions when, in the thaw, he was able to continue on his way.
Bello returns to France as the ship lieutenant. He performs for the Geographical Society and makes strong impression. But the Ministry of the Navy doesn't follow him in his plan to send under his command a French expedition. Without an assignment, he joins the English supply ship, the Phoenix, who is to sail to Beachy Island, where Belcher Squadron continues Franklin's search. Fate is on the move. During the night of Wednesday to Thursday, August the 18th in 1853, a violent storm sink the ship Guadalban. Bello has left a few days earlier, on foot, with four men, in charge of the dispatches arriving from London, which Belcher waits impatiently for. Belcher is blocked by ice some 40 kilometers northwest of Beachy Island. At that time, the ice pack covers the whole territory. Because of the storm, the ice pack breaks up. At first, Bello is isolated with two men on a drifting ice. He comes out of a hastily dug shelter. At Cape Bowden, it's probably a gale that carried him off. The raging icy waters will keep him for eternity. England, as we have said, has recognized Bellot's bravery, his selflessness, his faith in man. All the newspapers of the time mourned his death. Many writers, poets, transcended his memory. There, so far from his country that has forgotten him, a marble plaque remains on the Franklin Memorial. There remains a name engraved on a capstan. There is still a memorial grave that's long overdue to be recognized. There's still a cairn blown by the winds. There remains a single photography taken on Lady Franklin's initiative. We took it out of the archives of the Royal Geographical Society in London well, no one thought it was there, as if we had brought Bello back among the living.